Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I'm here at the Rock Island Auction House today. I'm looking at some of the guns that they'll be selling in December of 2015 at their premier auction. And something I wanted to touch on, because it's something I haven't looked at on video here before, is a pepper box pistol. Now, most people, when they think of a pepper box, you think of kind of this antique curio, weird sort of example of firearm oddity which isn't really the case. These were actually vastly popular pistols. There were tons of them made, and they were carried by a lot of people for several decades. So let's go back and, and look at some of the history surrounding where these guns came from. At the time, uh, the, the company that manufactured most of the ones that you'll find in the United States was called Allen & Thurber. It was formed by a guy named Ethan Allen in Massachusetts, and then uh, Thurber was his brother-in-law. Now, this company would go on to have other names. It would be known as uh, Allen, Thurber, and Company. It would become Allen and Wheellock. Uh, it would also become Forehand and Wadsworth. All of these companies are actually consisting of relatives from the same family. It's kind of interesting. Every, every few decades, they'd add some new nephew or son-in-law into the company and change the name. And the company subsisted for several generations, so you went through a whole bunch of these names. However, when they were making pepper boxes, it was primarily Allen and Thurber. Uh, they did this in a couple of different uh, cities in, well, they did Norwich, Connecticut, and then they also were primarily in Worcester, Massachusetts, making these guns. Their initial patent was 1837, and then they had an upgraded, kind of an improved patent in 1845. So the time frame when the pepper box was really at its peak was the late 1830s uh, through you know, the end of the 1850s or so, when Ultimately, what, what supplanted these were effective, cheap revolvers, and especially cartridge revolvers. Unlike the percussion revolver, the pepper box is not really conducive to conversion to using cartridges. So once metallic cartridges became a, a common thing in the market, the pepper box was really made obsolete. Until then, however, the pepper box, named, by the way, because it has this visual resemblance to a pepper mill or pepper grinder, um, but until the cartridges came out, the pepper box offered really a lot of benefits. Now, the reason we often don't think of them is because they were never a military firearm. They didn't have, they didn't offer the accuracy or the, the durability or the, the fine finish to really be worthwhile as a military weapon. Um, and this, this actually shows an interesting divide in, uh, in marketing tactics. So, Allen and Thurber ignored the military market. They didn't care. They weren't concerned about it. They were marketing guns to civilians, people who wanted a firearm for personal protection. And they were offering, really, a pretty high capacity gun for the time. If you didn't have a pepper box or maybe an expensive Colt Patterson revolver, really your other option would be a single shot pistol. And the pepper box would offer you six shots instead of one, which is quite a significant increase. These were very popular pistols during the gold rushes. Uh, they were inexpensive, high capacity. You know, if, if you're going out west and you need a handgun for protection, Pepper Box was a pretty appealing option. And Allen and Thurber sold gazillions of the things. Uh, Ethan Allen became quite impressively wealthy as a result. And the design didn't really change much for about 20 years. It really didn't need to. Um, the basic setup, they were all double action. Uh, double action only, you cannot manually cock the hammer. They use what's called a bar hammer. We'll take a closer look at that in a moment. And for most of their production, they were six-shot guns. Uh, later, in the mid-1850s, they introduced four- and five-shot versions, but primarily we're talking a six-shot gun, and the most common caliber was 32. Uh, they did get bigger and smaller. Um, you can find them eh, up to 36 caliber and down to about 28. But 32 caliber was common. And they are smooth bore, no sights. So, it's kind of funny, Mark Twain had some, some discussion of these in his book, Roughing It, and his, his point in most, most of the time when he's discussing these, what he's making light of is the fact that they were remarkably difficult to shoot accurately because they are smooth bore and they have no sights. Uh, however, for someone who wanted a gun for up close personal protection, hey, it, you know, it works. Um, so let's take a closer look at this. Um, there are dozens of different varieties of these guns, but they all share the same basic characteristics. So this is a pretty typical Allen & Thurber pepper box. It is 32 caliber. It's the, the middle standard size. 
Uh, there were some guns that were on a, a larger frame and some on a smaller frame. Both of those are, are fairly rare. This is also a relatively early gun. And we know that because it has this frame engraving and it has this shield that protects the percussion caps from each other. One of the potential issues with a pepper box, as with really any uh, multi-shot percussion gun, is the chance of a chain fire where spark from one cap will actually flash over and detonate another cap or another chamber. Now, on a revolver, this could be potentially pretty dangerous because you might have the, a chain firing projectile hit part of the barrel assembly on its way out, bounce around, fragment, damage the gun. In the case of a pepper box, there wasn't really any danger to the user from a multiple discharge because each chamber has its own complete barrel, so it just means you're gonna fire more shots than you intended. Uh, and this recoil shield, at, or this uh, percussion cap shield, did a, a reasonably decent job of preventing that from happening. Now, later on, as the market got tighter into the 1850s, uh, Alan Thurber did a number of things to cut production costs. They did things like they stopped putting this engraving on the frame, and they actually got rid of these shields. So later guns you'll find have all of the, the nipples and percussion caps exposed around the circumference. Now, I should point out, I realized I haven't even mentioned this, the defining characteristic of a pepper box is that you have a rotating cluster of barrels, and each one is a, a complete chamber and barrel. So on a revolver, you have a rotating cluster of chambers that all use the same single barrel. So each one has to, you, you line up the chamber with your barrel, fire, and then you have to rotate the chambers, line the next chamber up with the barrel, and fire again. On a pepper box, there, it, yes, you're doing basically the same thing. You're rotating and firing, but all you have to really line up is the hammer. You don't need a very precise alignment because you're not trying to jump a projectile from a chamber into a separate barrel. Each one of these is its own self-contained barrel. So that made them cheaper to produce. Uh, the fact that these are smooth bore also made them cheaper to produce. Uh, the way they did these was actually to have the frame and the barrel clusters each as a, a cast unit that was then machined to the, the final shape. Now, this has what's called a bar hammer, for obvious reason, just because that's the general shape. And they are double action, so on each firing, it will lift the hammer up, rotate the barrels, and then drop the hammer. Uh, there is no single action on this, so it's a little tricky to, uh, to demonstrate it without snapping it onto one of the nipples. In fact, something you'll often see is to have uh, the bottom of this bar relieved a bit because over extended use, they would actually flatten down the nipples and you could get to the point where the bar would hit the frame before it was able to detonate a cap and, and fail to fire. So that people on, on heavily worn guns, you'd take the bar and relieve it so that the hammer could actually drop a little bit farther and run reliably. Markings on these are pretty sparse. Uh, this one is Allen's patent, and normally there would be a date there as well, but on this one it's been worn off. Uh, the patent dates will either be 1837 or 1845. Uh, this one is actually engraved to J. Eaton. That's a, a post-factory thing, and I don't know who that guy is, but apparently he was pretty proud of having this pistol. Uh, we do also have a couple of markings on the barrel cluster. Patent looks like 1837 on this one and a cast steel barrel cluster. One, one of the problems with these guns from a collecting point of view is that there are so few markings on them. And that comes from them being an economy sort of uh, mass produced cheap item. The, the company didn't bother to put serial numbers on. They, you know, they manufactured them in several different locations over different periods of time, but they didn't bother to typically mark the manufacturing location because it just didn't matter. You know, they, they were making, make the gun, sell the gun, done. Uh, very few records exist on the company, so it's hard to get data to pin down things like when different variations were made, and that makes them challenging from a collector's perspective. At any rate, regardless of, uh, of the quality or the, the reputation from the time, these have a, a very definite place in firearms history today simply because they were so common. This was an excellent example in the 1830s, 40s, 50s of 
the working man's protection gun. It may not have been the best gun out there, but just like today, the gun that you could afford was better than the, the super fancy top of the line thing sitting on the shelf for a month's pay. Buy this for a few dollars and go on about your life. Thank you for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope I was able to shed some light on this rather unusual, um, you know, they're unusual today, but they were very common at the time. This is, frankly, a gun that was so common that most of them got worn out and nobody really took care of them or paid that much attention to them because it's just another Allen and Thurber pepper box, so why bother? Um, today, you know, today it's, it's really cool to actually find one of these. So if you would like to have this one, Take a look at the description. Uh, there is a link in the text that will take you to Rock Island's catalog page. You can look at their pictures and their description, place a bit online. Uh, there is a second Allen and Thurber pepper box in this auction, and there are uh, also a number of pepper boxes made in Europe as well. So those are less common, but they are uh, in this premier auction. So if these are anything you're looking for, check them out, and thanks for watching.